right right in line with this thinking of of um, that life cycle that you spoke about. Next up, we're going to talk about uh, disrupting supply chains through blockchain and AI. And of course, if you don't understand the supply chain, getting the carbon footprinting right is is pretty tough. So um, to take us through that, Jay Sederaman and Ramesh Kabinath, welcome. Uh, Jay is a professor and chair of industrial engineering and operations research at Columbia University. And Ramesh is the VP Organic Ventures, IBM Cloud and Cognitive Software Cell. Over to you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Uh, thank you, Christoph and Tomar, for the fascinating discussion as well. Um, so first, let me begin by acknowledging and thanking uh, the Center for uh, funding a seed uh, research project uh, involving my colleague, Garu Dayengar, collaborators Itai Feigenbaum, uh, Fahad Saleh, and a PhD student, Wenjin Wong. Uh, this project is on economics of blockchain adoption, um, and uh, I will include a link uh, to a research paper that we've written on this topic. Uh, but I want to spend the next 20 minutes or so uh, uh, talking to uh, Ramesh Gopinath, who is uh, from IBM, who's been responsible for building uh, the blockchain solution business at IBM. He's worked with a number of uh, industries in the past, including food safety, banking, financial services, global supply chains. And I thought we'd spend the next uh, few minutes uh, talking about uh, some of the challenges uh, that he sees in, uh, in supply chains, uh, how blockchains can help, what opportunities there are, uh, what challenges remain, and so on. Uh, and like with the previous uh, discussion, this is meant to be really a discussion uh, and we invite the audience members to submit questions that I can weave into our discussion as well. So if, if you have a pressing issue in your mind, feel free to type that into the Q&A and I'll, I'll monitor that as well. Uh, welcome, Ramesh. Yep, and, thank you. Sure. Um, so, so let's jump right in. Uh, so maybe you can tell me based on your experience, uh, maybe we can start with, you know, what do you think is the biggest challenge uh, facing supply chains uh, today? Yes, a lot of the problems that uh, occur in supply chains today, you know, most of them can be traced in my mind, I'll try to give examples, to lack of trusted uh, linking and information sharing in the supply chain. So I'll start with the first problem that I worked on, which is on food safety, right? You know, you basically buy something at your grocery store, you want to trust what you're eating, right? And, and essentially that basic thing to solve it, you got to stitch together the, you know, the supply chain all the way from the farm through multiple actors, all the way to the retail store from which you buy stuff. And this was all too well recognized, right? Just in the last couple of, Thanksgivings, you had issues with romaine lettuce and spinach and this, that, and the other thing. And more often than not, right, when this happens, typically it's like one farm, maybe one batch created a problem, but all spinach is pulled off shelves in the United States, right? This happened in 2006, by the way. So that requires information sharing. So this whole safety element requires stitching together data along the supply chain. Let me give you a few other examples, which is simple things like, you know, disputes in a supply chain. Typically between two parties, you could have issues related to quantity, quality, uh, you know, or price. Invoice disputes, hey, you know, on time in full delivery did not happen. These are all contractual obligations between companies where, you know, things fail because, you know, for one reason or another, say cold chain, right? Temperature related disputes. You know, if you deal with fresh beef patties and say, yeah, for burgers, Fresh beef is very different from frozen beef, right? So when that's handed off from the supplier to the, say, a restaurant chain, you want to make sure that things are within a certain temperature. How does that happen? Again, information has to be shared appropriately and in a trusted fashion. I'll give you a couple more examples. Sustainability we heard about earlier, right? How do you keep track of this carbon accounting along the supply chain for co cotton or whatever it might be? You basically have to first stitch together the supply chain and then make sure that you layer the data above it, right? So that you share the appropriate information so you can do those metrics that we heard from Christoph and Tamar, right? To be able to uh, talk about, you know, sustainability as well. 
fraud. You know, you know, it's quite. You know, I was quite surprised a few years ago. It turns out horse meat was sold as beef, and you know, in some part of the world, I don't know exactly where. So, you know, mislabeled seafood happens all the time, right? You want to basically pretend like farmed fish is wild caught fish. There are all sorts of things that happen there, which I think, as long as you can stitch together data along the supply chain and share it in a trusted fashion you know, many of these problems uh, get solved. And the last point I want to mention is just simple efficiency, right? Think about, you know, if, if you knew the inventory, you know, uh, that you have downstream and upstream, you know, of you, of the items you produce, right? Not just at your immediate customer, but further down, which typically you never get to see. You can do a better job of planning and even procuring, right? For, for the things that you manufacture is another thing that comes around. So there are all these problems that can be solved by trusted information sharing, yet it doesn't happen. Why? Right? So that's something we should get to. Right. So so, so I guess a lot of the, the challenges you mentioned uh, have to do with information sharing. Uh, yeah. This information is held by different parties. Uh, this is valuable as well. Um, so in going back to some of the, uh, the work that you've done, partnering with clients and so on, how do you, you know, what sorts of incentives uh, do these people have to actually share this information? What sorts of assurances do you need to give them uh, to make sure that uh, this information is not misused or used for a purpose different from what was intended? And, and how does all of this happen in a credible way? Yeah. Great question, Jay. So the fundamental problem is any supply chain actor, right? They do not want you know, information about their customers you know, to be shared with their suppliers or vice versa, right? They just want to maintain those relationships because they don't want to be disintermediate. So sharing of information, people do it extremely sparingly. That being said, if you do not share, however, you cannot do the stitching of you know, food from the farm all the way to the retail store. And if you don't do that, you're not able to do you know, food recalls in a, in a surgical fashion and so on and so forth. So we got to solve the sharing problem. And the approach that you know, we have done with IBM Food Trust and the lessons I've learned over the last five years is you got to basically give reassurances to the parties that the data that you provide will be selectively shared and selectively shared only with the participants, right? Who are supposed to see the information. So as a concrete example, if basically a farmer ships, I don't know, strawberries from the farm downstream to some, you know, uh, uh, dis distributor, that information about when it was harvested, where it was harvested, all that information is only made available to, let's say, a Walmart store if that particular batch of strawberries landed at the Walmart store, right? So in some sense, Basically, you don't know as a farmer where all your product is going to go. But if we stitch that information together by just literally, and how we stitch, I'll give you, I'll make it concrete in a second. And, and that basically enables you to, you know, say something along the following lines. I'm a farmer. I upload some information about the harvest and I just give it, you know, a statement. Please share it with anybody who touches my strawberries, right? That's the approach we took in IBM Food Trust. Those who upload information say, look, these are the parameters. Those who basically deal with my product get to see it and nobody else. And then the system automatically handles it. And all of the trust underlying the system is based on leveraging blockchain technology. It just basically turns out that basically we use blockchain to make it happen. There could be other ways to also make it happen, right? That's what we do. But just to make it very concrete, how do we do the stitching? I just wanted to make it clear to people, right? So the way it's done is every participant in the supply chain. So if I'm basically, say I'm somewhere in the middle of the supply chain, right? Let's say I make pizza, right? And I basically get from upstream, you know, a whole bunch of ingredients, cheese and wheat flour and what else, right? Come from upstream. And then I make the pizza, let's say it's frozen pizza, and I ship it downstream to the retailers, right? Every participant, all they need to do is what did I get from upstream in the supply chain and when, what items, what batches, et cetera. What did I do with the stuff? So manufacturing of the pizza, et cetera, et cetera. And that also happens in batches. And where did I ship it downstream? To whom? 
If that information is sent, you can easily imagine it right? intuitively it's very simple. If everybody along the supply chain does that, you can easily stitch it together. But how do you do it in a fashion where you don't reveal unnecessary information, right? That's where all the magic is. So that's basically what IBM Food Trust you know, does today, right? In terms of stitching together data from the supply chain. Um, so, so I think the, the food trust, uh, you know, is an example of a success story. Um, are there, you know, have you, you know, have you tried, uh, have you worked on things that uh, did not, you know, end up going to the next stage? And if so, what sorts of difficulties prevented uh, implementation uh, of, of the blockchain for a particular, in a particular context? Yeah, so I've been involved in three blockchain solutions so far uh, and, and a few others from third parties as well. Uh, specifically, the work that we did with uh, IBM Food Trust, you know, taught us a lot about, hey, look, you know, the stitching together we did for food can be used for all sorts of other things too, right? Because what we built is an engine that does you know, stitching together, not just for single ingredient items like strawberries, but also complex multi-ingredient things like baby food or pizza and stuff like that. So we were able to use the same underlying technology and let other parties build their solutions on top of our technology. We called it the blockchain transparent supply and it's being used, for example, in a coffee network. Right? So literally in the coffee supply chain, it's being used by a company called Pharma Connect. It's being used in, in the wine supply chain by a company called you know, E-Provenance and you know, all the, the names I'm giving, you know, there are links that are you know, available for you on the chat, right? You have that. Then you have one for the tire supply chain and so on and so forth. So we did a few solutions, but we had others also build solutions. And why we did that also I can explain. The key is the biggest challenge to making these blockchain solutions work like Food Trust is you know, getting the ecosystem to come together, right? It's not just about the sharing, okay? You can make them comfortable that you can share, but incentives, you actually touched upon it earlier too. How do you make sure that everybody gets something out of it, right? And you're, what you get, you know, in terms of, up, you know, the data I upload, you know, who, you know, am I getting enough value for that, number one? And number two, the data I receive from others, am I getting value for it? And, you know, and also the trust, right? You know, can I trust that data that comes to me? Can I trust that my data doesn't go elsewhere? All of that basically is, you know, uh, you know, takes a tremendous amount of time and effort to make the ecosystem comfortable. So we kind of let others, right, take our technology and do the same thing. So there's a few examples like that. A couple of quick things I wanted to mention also. Another, the second solution that we did was, it's a very different from the food supply chain, but extremely interesting too, is most things you buy today, there's a high likelihood it came on a nice big uh, steel uh, box in a nice big ship, right? It, you know, it's $15 trillion worth of global trade happening. Most of it, you know, goes on ocean shipping uh, container ships. If you look at that supply chain too, right? There are so many handoffs, right? Trucking companies in China for all the way to some trucking companies in the US, there is Maersk in the middle and so on and so forth. They can be extremely complex, right? And to add to the, on, on top of the complexity where information sharing is useful, there is also this element of customs paperwork and things like that, right? The paperwork that goes with international data so much, approval processes, you can capture all of that in, 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 in a blockchain-based smart contract is the other idea. So that's the second solution. Uh, it's called TradeLens. It basically has about 2 billion plus of you know, transactions on that system. Com by comparison, Food Trust is slightly smaller in, in terms of the number of transactions, probably like uh, 50 million transactions to give you a sense of the scale that we're talking about. The third solution we built is called Trust Your Supplier that is dealing with sharing of information on supplies. If I want to do business with a supplier, if somebody else has already done business with them, right? Then if that information is somehow available for me to leverage, that could be useful. That's basically the use case. And all of these are success stories. I'll also give you some, you know, so some areas where that has primarily been in spaces where the ecosystem is super fragmented. So corralling people coming together and making it happen is extremely, you know, sort of difficult. So food trust, even though we have been super successful, the, re the reality is we have just scratched the surface, right? Because we have, you know, 300 odd 
companies there on the system today. But think about it, the number of food supplies in the, in the global so is much bigger. And to get there, it's nowhere at the pace at which we anticipated we ought to be. So there is good news and also bad news in the sense things do take sometimes a lot longer. So, so I want to expand on, on two things that you mentioned. One is this uh, trust your supplier uh, type idea. Yeah. You think, uh, so, so that somehow, you know, the, the food trust and other things somehow convey the notion of a, of a supply chain, uh, of a blockchain that's permissioned, that, uh, that's controlled by a consortium or, or a few big players. Uh, the trust your supplier type thing is 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 that a possibility that something like it can be on an open chain or uh, what i have in mind is if one can use those sorts of uh, technologies to reduce such frictions to improve efficiencies uh, not just in a in a restricted way because it's possible that ingredients that get used in 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 one industry are also useful in in other things and there may be opportunities uh, that are uh, that that pe participants don't realize now that that may come about because of this collaboration. Do you... yeah, that, yeah, it's Go a great ahead. question, Jay. So, in, in terms of trust your supplier, also you know the way uh, we are building. And by the way, that solution is is built along with a company called Chainyard. The other two are IBM owned. You know, the, the other two, are, Food Trust is IBM owned. Trade Lens is jointly with Merce, the shipping company. I just want to acknowledge that. And the trusted supply solution is with Chainyard. That too is a permission blockchain. And I, the way I would state it is this current state of permissionless blockchains is such that I don't see enterprises using uh, you know, permissionless blockchain for any, in most use cases, simply because you want to trust who's running your blockchain database, if you want to call it that, right? And that mm -hmm. itself, you know, so right out of the bat, you, you know immediately that, you know, it has to be permissioned or at least somewhat controlled. You know, it's not completely anonymous participants and you know, sort of managing the database. Right. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry, I'd lost my train of thought. So you, you, your question was specifically what again? Um, so is, is there a way to somehow um, to, to leverage blockchain participation uh, to create new opportunities yeah. to, to somehow discover uh, uh, new relationships, let's say, that, yes. that wouldn't otherwise be formed. So maybe I'll give an example. This has not happened in reality, but it's the kind of thing that is possible, right? So, so remember last year we had the pandemic, right? The unfortunate thing yeah. was, <laughs> uh, we are in the middle of it. I, the unfortunate thing was in like April, May, June of last year, when you know, you know, N95 masks were in great demand, right? On the one hand, in the in the healthcare industry, there was a big problem of scarcity of N95 masks. Meanwhile, in the construction industry, there was a surfeit of it, right? Because the construction industry also uses these sorts of masks. And if again, the big if, if for example, both industries were using some track and trace solution like food trust to keep track of you know um, uh, the say a 95 mass what you would have is a lot just because of the data that's used to track and trace you would be able to also get inventory in the supply chain right that's a, an important point right it's not just basic data that's being shared to link things together but you get additional information like the inventory across the supply chain so if the inventory in one industry let's say the uh, construction industry you know is visible to the to you know some other in industry like for example healthcare, we could have you know solved that problem to a large extent, right? It's not that we would have had enough masks. That's not what I'm saying. At least we could have moved from one to the other, right? And such things are possible. And I think it's it's, it's a little far out because first we need individual supply chains in specific industries to be starting to leverage this information sharing cap capability, right? Blockchain or otherwise is not relevant to me ability to share information in a trusted fashion would lead to you know visibility into things like inventory along the supply chain and stuff like that that would have enabled this sort of movement between industry which i've never seen but i would have loved to see and of course it happened in pockets where you know some construction workers hey i've got all these masks i can send it to my doctor friends that did happen but i but at an industrial scale it did not happen right um so a couple of final questions before we get to the q a 
One is, uh, I mean, uh, so so it's, it it seems like in in many many cases uh, the information sharing in a trusted way will end up benefiting the end consumers, um, and yet they may not be power they they may not have the leverage or the power to to create uh, this trusted information sharing. Are there you know do you know of cases where uh, this has been driven by consumers rather than by rather than the other way around by big suppliers or uh, big intermediate players in the in the supply chain, and you know just following up on that, do you foresee you know all of the the, the food trust being an integral part of of uh, everyday life for end consumers that all of the food that we consume somehow has this. Uh, capability of being traced back to source and, and so on. Yeah, so on the latter question, I think uh, I wish the answer is yes, I'll leave it at that. But I think more importantly, right, sharing information to make supply chains more effective is so valuable that blockchain or otherwise, right, over time, People try to do that in the food supply chain and you know, in, in various other supply chains is what I believe, right? I truly believe that is going to happen. It'll take time, but it'll, it'll happen. I think there's so much value that you can get over and above the just basic information sharing, because I truly believe that most of the problems in supply chains from disputes to sustainability, to fraud, to safety, all of those basically will be impacted, right? So I think that will certainly happen. That will certainly. Okay, wonderful. Um, are there, you know, topics that are not, you know, within the space that are not getting the attention that they deserve, either from academics or uh, or industry, uh, you know, things that that you believe ought to be studied more or understood more? Yeah, I think. A uh, couple of thoughts here, right? It's not going to be comprehensive. One is there is a lot of progress happening in cryptographic techniques that are getting ready for prime time, fully homomorphic encryption that allows you to do computational encrypted data, zero knowledge proofs, uh, secure multi party computations, right? Blockchain is one bag, tool bag of cryptographic techniques. If you combine all of these things together, I think the ability to share information across supply chains, you know, within a particular industry or across will, you know, hopefully, you know, be improved over time. And that could lead to some dramatic efficiencies in the supply chain is what I believe, right? So this sort of, uh, uh, you know, leveraging multiple technologies that help you to share information in a trusted fashion, in, in multiple ways, right? I can share the information that I receive from others. I can, you know, uh, be comfortable that what I share with others is not misused and it gets only to the right parties. And also I know who I am dealing with, right? From a business perspective, trust your supply. All of these, you know, there are, there is no single technology that, you know, you know, meet all the use cases what I've learned over the last few years. So you want to view them as a bag of cryptographic techniques that you bring to bear to sol solve specific problems, right? That will you know, chip away at the various you know, sort of challenges within the supply chain. That's basically the, the path I would suggest people take. The other thing is also try to identify industries where which are concentrated in some sense, because fragmented industries, getting everybody to agree to is gonna be a tough one. Right. The last point I would mention is where you started with in terms of your own project, right? understanding incentive mechanisms to make sure everybody feel like they get something out of this is easier said than done, right? And in fact, what I feel is if you don't solve that problem, you know, you, you know, a lot of things, even though it makes perfect sense and it should happen, may not happen. In other words, what I'm saying is some things take a very long time to do. So you got to do it in many steps. Each step of the way, there should be enough value generated to generate enough you know, sort of revenue and, you know, sort of profits for the company that's doing it to be able to reinvest and grow further, right? So to go on the journey, you want to be able to do it, you know, in a fashion where there is constant, you know, progress, 
improvement and money along the way. And that is hard when you're dealing with very, very complex supply chains. So that's a challenging space too, incentives. Wonderful. Thank you, Ramesh. So th there are a few questions. So let me select a, a few and ask those and the others we'll try to answer uh, in, in a chat later. Um, so are there alternatives to blockchain to manage supply, ch supply chain sharing in a trusted way? Um, I think you alluded to it, but maybe you want to uh, briefly answer that as well. Yeah. So, you know, the way I think about it is, look, you know, to share information in a trusted fashion with the supply chain, you, you know, certain things help, like immutability of the data helps, non-repudiation helps, right? You can't say I didn't do that, that's, that sort of thing. There are a few properties. You take your standard traditional database, slap over all those properties on top, you know, you, you might as well call it a blockchain is the way I view it. So to me, blockchain is not some religious thing that you know it has to be the specific thing. It's more about certain properties that you want for enabling the information sharing. And I already, as I already mentioned, it's not just about blockchain, right? It's also about ZKP, zero knowledge proofs and SMCs and FHE and all these other technologies. Think of them as a tool bag of cryptographic techniques you use to make people comfortable about sharing the data and trusting the data. Very good. Um... So I'm wondering how this project can help small business, especially small local grocery stores, since they are very cost sensitive and not very profit searching. So, so I guess uh, the, it talks about people who may not have may not have the scale to participate in in something. Yeah. Like this, so but... two, let me give you two points that you know. One is um, even though the example I'm going to give us was done by a large company Carrefour and all that, and IBM Food Trust, but the idea is the following, right? If you're a small farmer who wants to tell a story about the product, you do farming practice in a very unique, special way, whatever, right? If you basically have these sorts of solutions that I just talked about, like IBM Food Trust, which, which sort of stitches things together, you can send, you know, sort of, if you can share some information with the end consumer all the way, right? So you can, you can get your idea across, you can sort of build your brand, if you want to call it that, but this is the little guy. So, you know, I don't want to use words like brand, but the idea is, the fact that you do something special or unique, you should be, you can reach your end customers through this sort of technology. The converse, so th that's because you're skipping many people in the middle of that supply chain, right? Going straight from the farmer to the end customer. Let me give you the converse too, right? This is being done by Farmer Connect, which is our coffee network. So if you buy, you know, a cup of, if you buy coffee, right? In fact, this these guys have it, you know, for a certain brand of Folgers uh, coffee, you buy it on Amazon, there's a QR code, you scan it, you can actually sh thank your farmer, right? They, they have set things up there, you know, the community from which the coffee grows, right? And comes, you know, all the way to you as an end consumer buying it out of, uh, you know, Amazon. You know, you can actually pay back, you know, I don't know, 10 bucks or whatever you want to, to that community, right? Which is a very interesting thank your farmer application they built. So I think you know, there is things, there are things that the end consumer can do that could, you know, go back in the supply chain and vice versa is the way I would put it. Yeah. Wonderful. So I think we are out of time. So I want to, I want to uh, thank Ramesh for, uh, for the discussion. Uh, I can't believe uh, 30 minutes go by so fast. Uh, so thank you very much. There are a bunch of questions which we'll get to uh, after, uh, af uh, you know, in a, in a little while and they'll be answered uh, in the chat. So thank you. thank you so much. Thank you, Jay and Ramesh. And, and I think those last words, Ramesh, set us up perfectly for, for the next session. So learning about how we can have trusted su supply chains is, is certainly important for our future. And, and now we're going to learn about how we make sure that, that there's not corruption and there's trust and there's a way to... Um, have a finance in place to make sure that the money goes to the right places.